from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The True Tale of the Phantom Coach The great curtain had fallen after the pantomime and I was standing chatting on the stage of the theatre at Cambridge when one of the stage men came to tell me I was wanted at the stage door and I must hurry up at once. Thither I proceeded and found a lot of golfing boys, hunting boys, dramatic boys, and all sorts of other merry varsity boys who shouted out, Come along quick to the Blue Pig. The Blue Pig is a Cambridge name for the Blue Boar Hotel. We want you to meet a fellow called Willie Carson, and there's to be supper, and he has something to tell us. The bogeyman has gone on there now, so come right away. Well, off we went to the Blue Boar Hotel, and we found Carson sitting over a blazing fire with a capital supper set in his nice old-fashioned room, lit up with candles only, the picture of comfort. Outside it was snowing hard and bitterly cold. After a talk over the merits of the pantomime, we did full justice to a most excellent supper, and then crowded round the blazing hearth to hear a story our host wanted to tell us. Did you ever hear of the phantom coach of St. Andrews, he asked, turning to me suddenly and removing his cigar. Often, I replied, I've heard most extraordinary yarns about it from lots of people, but why do you ask? Because I've seen it, he replied softly and thoughtfully. Some five years ago, it was very, very strange, not to be forgotten and quite unexplainable. That is why I asked you here tonight. I want to talk to you about it. He stooped over the fire and was silent for a few minutes. Tell us all about it, we all shouted at once. We won't make fun of it. There is nothing to make fun of, indeed. It's a true solemn fact, he said. Listen, and I will try to tell you what I saw, but I can't have picture properly. Five years ago, I had just come home from America. I went to stay at St. Andrews for some golf. I think it was the latter end of August, and I must have been in the town about a week at least, when one night, it was hot and stuffy, and about midnight, I determined to take a good long country walk and struck out right along the road to Strathkinness. It was a hot, dark and stormy night, not wet. Fitful black clouds floated now and again at a rapid pace over the moon, which now and then shone out brightly. In the distance, the sea made a perpetual moan, and at intervals the dark eastern sky was lit up by flashes of summer wildfire lightning over the distant cathedral towers. Now and again I could hear the mutter of faraway thunder, and there was incessant gusts of wind. I must have been about two miles along the road when I could discern some very large object approaching me rapidly. As it came nearer, I noticed it resembled a coach, dark, heavy, primitive. It seemed to have four large black horses, and the driver was a muffled, shapeless figure. It approached with a low humming or buzzing sound, which was most peculiar and unpleasant to hear. The horses made a hollow kind of ticking sound with their feet, otherwise it was noiseless. No earthly coach of the kind could go without any ordinary sound. It was weird and eerie in the extreme. As it passed me, the moon shone out brightly, and I saw for a second a ghastly white face at the coach window. But I saw those four strange, silent black horses, the more extraordinary, tall, swaddled-up, shapeless driver, and the quaint, black, gloomy old coach with a coffin-shaped box on the roof, only far, far too well. One most remarkable thing was that it threw no shadow of any kind. Just as it passed me, there was a terrific roar of thunder and a blaze of lightning that nearly blinded me, and in the distance, 
I saw that horrible, ghastly, receding coach. Then clouds came over the moon, and all was black. A darkness. One could feel a darkness of a shut-up, smothering vault. I felt sick and dazed for a minute or two. I could not make out if I had been struck by the lightning or was paralyzed. However, after a bit it passed off. It was a horrible, deathly feeling while it lasted. I never experienced a similar sensation before or since and hope I never may again. Another very curious thing was the behavior of my favorite collie dog. Usually frightened at nothing, on the approach of the phantom, for phantom it was. He crouched down, shivering and whining, and as it drew nearer, flood with a bark like a screech, and cowered down in the ditch at the roadside, and gave forth low growls. I tell you, boys, it's all right in this room to talk about it, but none of you would have liked to be in my place that queer, uncanny night on that lonely road. That it was supernatural, I am convinced. It is a very thin veil between us and the unseen world of spirits. They say I possess a seventh sense, namely second sight, and I know I shall never forget that night's experience. But listen, the story is not ended yet. Next morning a telegram arrived from my brother in Kent. Are you all right? I wondered much, and wired back that I was very well. The following day a letter came from my brother giving me a curious explanation. The following afternoon of the day I saw the coach, my brother was looking out of the old manor house windows in Kent when he and several others noticed a large bird having most peculiar plumage sitting on the garden wall. No one had ever seen a bird of the kind before. He was rushing off for a gun to shoot it when our father, who looked very white and scared, stopped him. Do not shoot, he said. It would be of no use. That is the bird of ill omen to all our race. It only appears before death. I have only once seen it before. That week your dear mother died. My brother was so alarmed at this that he sent the wire I have mentioned to me at St. Andrews. By the next mail from Australia we learned that our eldest brother had died there the very day I saw the coach at St. Andrews and my brother saw the bird at our home in Kent. Very odd, is it not? But what do you know about that coach? Only tales, I said. Many people swear they have heard it or seen it on stormy nights. I know a girl who swears to it and also a doctor who passed it on the road and it nearly frightened his horse to death and him too. The tale of the two tramps is funny. They were trudging into St. Andrews one wild stormy night when this uncanny coach overtook them. It stopped, the door opened, and the white hand beckoned towards them. One tramp rushed up and got in, then suddenly the door noiselessly shut and the coach moved off, leaving the other tramp alone in the pitiless wind and rain. I never saw my old mate again, said the tramp, when he told the tale, and I never shall, that their old coach was nothing of this here world of ours. It took my old mate off to Davy Jones' locker, mighty smart, poor fellow. They say his body was found in the sea some months afterwards, and the tale goes that the phantom coach finishes its nocturnal journey in the waves of St. Andrew's Bay. Whose coach is it? asked all that were in the room. I cannot say. Some say Bethune, others Sharp, and others Haxton. I do not know who is supposed to be the figure inside, unless it is his satanic majesty himself. At all events, it seems a certain fact that a phantom coach has been seen from time to time on the roads round St. Andrews. I have never seen any of these things myself. Well, said Carson, that awful coach does appear. It appeared to me, and doubtless in the course of time will appear to many others. It bodes no one any good, and I pity with all my heart anyone who meets it. Beware of those roads late at night, or like me, you may some day to your injury meet that ghastly, uncanny, old phantom coach. If so, you will remember it till your dying day. Curious thing that about seeing the coach and the bird at the same time, and in two places so far apart, murmured the golfing Johnny. And then Carson's brother, 
time, too. I'd sooner see the bird than the coat, said one. Guess I'd rather not see either of them, said an American present. Glad we have no phantom coaches in Yankee land. The Veiled Nun of St. Leonard's Curiously enough, although I have been in many old haunted castles and churches at the exactly correct hour, for example, midnight in Scotland, England, Wales, and the Rhine country, I've never been able to see or hear a ghost of any sort. The only thing of the kind I ever saw was an accidental meeting with a far-famed spring Hill Jack in a dark lane at Helensburg. It was many years ago, and as I was very small and he was of immense proportions, the meeting was distinctly unpleasant for me. Now, from legends we learned that St. Andrews is possessed of a prodigious number of supernatural appearances of different kinds, sizes, and shapes, most of them of an awe-inspiring and blood-curdling type. In fact, so numerous are they, eighty in number they seem to be, that there is really no room for any modern aspirants who may want a quiet place to appear and turn people's hair white. It might be well to mention a few of them before telling the tale of the veiled nun of St. Leonard's Church Avenue. We will put aside ordinary banshees and things that can only be heard. While there is the celebrated phantom coach that Willie Carson told us of, it has been heard and seen by many. There is also a white lady that used to haunt the Abbey Road, the ghost of St. Rule's Tower, the Haunted Tower Ghost, the Blackfriars Ghost, the Wraith of Haxton of Rathillet, the Specter of the Old Castle, the Dancing Skeletons, the Smothered Piper Lad, the Phantom Bloodhound, the Priory Ghost, and many, many more. The Nun of St. Leonard's is as curious and interesting as any of them, though a bit weird and gruesome. In the time of charming Mary Stuart, our white queen, there lived in the old South Street a very lovely lady belonging to a very old Scottish family, and her beauty and wit brought many admirers to claim her hand, but with little or no success. She waved them all away. At last she became a fiance to a fine and brave young fellow who came from the East Lothian country, and for some months all went merrily as a marriage bell. But at last clouds overspread the rosy horizon. She resolved that she would never become an earthly bride, but would take the veil and become a bride of Holy Church, a nun in point of fact. When her lover heard that she had left home and entered a house of Holy Sisters, he at once announced his intention of hastening to St. Andrews seizing her and marrying her at once. In this project, it would seem the young lady's parents were in perfect agreement with the devoted youth. He did hasten to St. Andrews almost immediately, and there received a terrible shock. The once lovely and loved maiden, he discovered that she had done what she had actually written and threatened to do. Sooner than be an earthly bride, she had mutilated her face by slitting her nostrils. She had cut off her eyelids and both her top and bottom lips and had branded her fair cheeks with cruel hot irons. The poor youth, on seeing her famous beauty thus destroyed, fled to Edinburgh where he committed suicide and she, after becoming a nun, died from grief and remorse. That all happened nearly 400 years ago, but her spirit with a terribly marred and mutilated face still wanders o' nights in the peaceful little avenue to old St. Leonard's Iron Kirk Gate down the Penn's Road. She is all dressed in black with a long black veil over the once lovely face and carries a lantern in her hand. Should any bold visitor to that avenue meet her, she slowly sweeps her face veil aside, raises the lantern to her scarred face and discloses those awful features to his horrified gaze. Here's a curious thing that I know happened there a few years ago. I knew a young fellow here who was reading up theology and church canon law. I also knew a great friend of his, an old Cambridge man, the former I will call Wilson, and the latter Talbot, as I do not want to give the exact names. 
Well, Wilson had invited Talbot up to St. Andrews for a month of golf, and he arrived here on a Christmas day. He came to my rooms for about ten minutes, and I never saw anyone merrier and brighter and full of old days at Cambridge. Then he hurried off to see the links and the club. Late that evening, Wilson rushed in. Come along quick and see Talbot. He's awfully ill, and I don't know what's up a bit. I went off and found Talbot in his lodgings with a doctor in attendance, and he certainly looked dangerously ill, and seemed perfectly dazed. Wilson told me that he had to go to see people on business that evening down by the harbor, and that he took Talbot with him down the Penn's Road. It was a fine night, and Talbot said he would walk about the road and enjoy a cigar till his friends return. In about half an hour, Wilson returned up the road, but could see Talbot nowhere in sight. After hunting about for a long time, he found him leaning against the third or fourth tree up the little avenue to St. Leonard's Kirk Gate. He went up to him, when Talbot turned a horrified face towards him, saying, Oh my God, have you come to me again? and fell down in a fit or a swoon. He got some passerbys to help to take poor Talbot to his rooms. Then he came round for me. We sat up with him in wonder and amazement, and briefly this is what he told us. After walking up and down the Penn's Road, he thought he would take a survey of the little avenue, when at the end he saw a light approaching him, and he turned back to meet it. Thinking it was a policeman, he wished him good evening, but got no reply. On approaching near, he saw it to be a veiled female with a lantern. Getting quite close, she stopped in front of him, drew aside her long veil, and held up the lantern towards him. My God, said Talbot, I can never forget or describe that terrible, fearful face. I felt choked, and I fell like a log at her feet. I remembered no more till I found myself in these rooms, and you two fellows sitting beside me. I leave this place tomorrow. And he did by the first train. His state of panic was terrible to see. Neither Wilson nor Talbot had ever heard of the tales of the awful apparition of the St. Leonard's nun, and had almost forgotten the existence of the strange story, till so curiously reminded of it. I never saw Talbot again, but had a letter from him a year after written from Rangfels telling me that on Christmas Day he had had another vision, dream, or whatever it was, of the same awful specter. About a year later I read in a paper that poor old Talbot had died on Christmas night at Rosario of heart failure. I have often wondered if the dear old chap had had another visit from the terrible veiled nun of St. Leonard's Avenue. The Monk of St. Rule's Tower some years ago, I was perfectly surrounded with crowds of bonny children in the St. Albums, Holborn district of London. I fancy they belonged to some guild or other, and they enacted the part of imps, fairies, statues, etc., in various pantomimes and neighboring theaters. I had been invited there to amuse the kiddies with songs and imitations, and now they were all shrieking and yelling at the top of their voices for a ghost story. It's getting near Christmas, they all shouted, and we all want to hear about ghosts real creepy ghosts. I pointed out the fact that most ghost stories were bunkum, and that such tales were very apt to keep wee laddies and lassies awake at night. But bless you, they wouldn't listen to that one bit. They wanted ghosts, and ghosts they would have. Well, in about an hour I had yarned off most of my best bogey stories. I had used up most of my tales regarding Scottish, English, and Continental castles, and the banshees, water kelpies, wraiths, etc. connected therewith, but still those children, like Oliver Twist, demanded more. I really was fairly stumped, when all of a sudden my mind flew back to when a strange story was told me by Captain Chester in the Corso grounds at beautiful Baden-Baden. I first fell in with his dear old warrior in Rome, and we became firm friends and traveled together for many cheery weeks. He told me his queer tale and the very strongest of military language, which I must omit. The language will be suitable to use in bunkers, but not on paper. It was a sultry day, so were his remarks. It would seem that many years before, he had visited Scotland and England 
to try and see a ghost or two. He had been to Coomerhurst in order to investigate the appearance of ill-fated Amy Robsart. He went to Raynham Hall to interview the famous brown lady, and he journeyed to Hampton Court to hear the shrieking ghost, and also went to Church Dalton to see if he could fix the ghost at the Copper Hole. In Scotland, he followed the scent of various ghosts and finally landed in St. Andrews. By Jove, sir, he said, that's the place for ghosts. Every blessed corner is full of them, bang full. Look at those fellows in the castle dungeons and beaten and sharp and the men that got hanged and burned and the old devil, I mean, witches. I saw my ghost there years and years ago. I took an old house in St. Andrews, which was a small place then. Very little golf was played and there was very little to do, but gad, sir. The ghosts were thick, and the quaint old bodies in the town were full of them. They could spin yarns for hours about phantom coaches, death knells, corpse candles, people going about in winding sheets, phantom hearses, and Lord knows what else. I loved it. it took me quite back to the Middle Ages. So I told these children Captain Chester's tale as nearly as possible in his own words, minus the forcible appetites. I managed to hit off his voice and manner, and this particular seemed to amuse the barons. Egad, sir, he said, it was a curious time. Of all the tales I heard, the one that pleased and fascinated me most was the legend of the monk that looks over St. Regulus Tower on moonlit nights. I went thither every night and constantly fancied I saw a figure peering over the edge, but was not certain. Then I got hold of a very old man who related to me the old legend. It seems that years ago there was a good prior of St. Andrews named Robert de Montrose. He ruled well, gently, and wisely, but among the monks there was one who was always in hot water, and whom Prior Robert had often to haul over the coals. He played practical jokes, often absented himself from the daily and nightly offices of Holy Kirk, and otherwise upset the rules and discipline. Finally, when Earl Douglas and his retinue came to St. Andrews to present to the cathedral a costly statue long known as the Douglas Lady, this monk made desperate love to one of the waiting women of Lady Douglas. For this he was imprisoned in the Priory Dungeon for some days. It was a custom of Robert de Montrose almost every fine night to ascend the Tower of St. Rule and admire the view. The summit was reached those days by means of ladders and wooden landings, not as it is now by a stair. In those days, too, the apse and part of the nave were still standing, and the summit of the solemn old tower was crowned by a small spire. One evening, just before Yuletide, when the prior, as usual, was on the top of the tower, the contumacious monk slyly followed him up the ladders, stabbed him in the back with a small dagger, and flung him over the north side of the old tower. I thought, Captain Chester, I said, that the murder took place on the dormitory stairs. Gadzooks, an odd bakken, sir, I'm telling you what I was told, and what I can prove, sir. All right, I replied, please fire away. Well, continued Chester, they told me the prior had often been seen since peeping over the tower, and at times he was seen to fall, as he did years ago, from the summit. By the by, his assassin was starved to death and buried in some old midden. One moonlit night, as my brother and I were standing on the Kirk Hill, to our horror and amazement, we saw a figure appear suddenly on the top of the tower, leap onto the parapet, and deliberately jump over. Zounds, sir, my blood ran cold. We did not hesitate long, but jumped the low wall of the cathedral. It was easily done in those days and we were young and active and hurried to the grim old tower. Just as we neared it, a monk passed us in the Augustinian habit. His cowl was thrown back, and for just one second we had a view of his pallid, handsome face and keen, penetrating eyes. Then he disappeared as suddenly as he had appeared, and we were alone in the moonlight, nothing stirring. That is very odd, I said. Zook, sir, I have odder things still to tell you. We went home to the old house, had supper, and retired to bed. Thoughtfully, 
I woke about 2 a.m. The blinds were up and it was clear as day with the moonlight. Imagine my blank astonishment when I clearly perceived, leaning up against the mantelpiece, the pallid monk I had seen a few hours before near the square tower. He leaned on his elbow and was gazing intently at me, while in his hand he held some object that had a blue glitter in the moonbeams. He smiled. Fear not, brother, he said. I am Prior Robert of Montrose, who quitted this earth many years since, and of whom you have been talking and thinking so much of late days. I saw you tonight in our cruelly ruined Abbey Kirk. Alas, alas, but I come from Ayant. The distant hills I have far to go tonight. What do you want, Holy Father? I said, and what of your murder? That is forgiven and forgotten long since, he said, and I love to revisit at times my old haunts, and so does he. You have in your regiment, methinks, one named Montrose, a scion of our family? Yes, I said. I know Bob Montrose well. See this dagger I hold, said Prior Robert. It was with this I lost my life on this earth many years since on the tower of blessed St. Rule. They buried it with me in my stone kist. I will leave it here with you to give to my kinsman, for it will prove of use to him ere he pass hence. Mark my words. He raised his hand as an act of blessing and melted away. I fell back in a sleep or in a faint. When I woke, the morning sun was streaming into my bedroom. At first I thought I had eaten too much supper and had a nightmare, but there on the table by my bed lay an old dagger of curious workmanship, the dagger that slew the prior years and years ago. I faithfully fulfilled my vow, and my friend, Major Bob Montrose, has now got his monkish ancestor's dagger. That's all Captain Chester told me, dear children. Goodbye. Don't forget me, and do not forget old St. Andrew's ghosts, the Tower of St. Rule, and the specter of Prior Robert of Montrose. Then a modern handsome whirled me away to King's Cross.